The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Great, fantastic. All right, I'm Matthew Connerton. We're going to talk about features. A lot to get covered, and we're already late, so we'll just jump right into it. So uh, what is a feature? And the naming when they came up with this is kind of uh, wacky to explain. So when you think about Drupal, uh, you know, you want to build a Drupal website. You have different features that are going to go into that website, a blog, a calendar. You know, how would I make that calendar? I download the events module, the date module, I mean uh, the calendar module, the date module. Uh, I'd create an events content type, give it some fields. I'd create a view uh, based on the calendar template. Uh, you know, I'd maybe I'd add an image and create a uh, image cache preset. Maybe I'd create a context to show the mini calendar on the front page and then show latest events on the calendar page. All of these steps go into making this section of this website, this use case. Well, what Features does is it lets you collect all of these different components into a single reusable module so the next time you need to make a events calendar, you don't have to do all that stuff again. You can just reinstall this uh, events calendar that you created on the other site. And so it's a collection of Drupal component components that come together to satisfy a use case. So what can I put inside my features? Well, all of this stuff, uh, everything on the left-hand side is what you can put in out of the box. Turn on features, you can start exporting this stuff, no problem. On the right-hand side uh, are contributions to the features module uh, with system variables. We use the strong R module. Uh, I don't really use blocks anymore. I like the boxes module because it has machine names and inline editing. So I, uh, you know, use the box module for exporting blocks and so forth and so forth. Uh, there's many, many things that can export the features. And if there's a module that has some sort of object or data in the database that's not exportable to features yet, well, it's not terribly difficult to do it. Uh, you know, you can extend the, the features API and you know, submit a patch or CTools has a great API for adding support for exporting features. So features creates these modules. So how are these modules any different than a regular Drupal module? Well, there's three main differences. When you hit download on a uh, Drupal feature uh, from your features UI, it's generating code for you. You're not sitting down at a text editor and handwriting this stuff. It's going to create it for you. Um, the functionality is being collected to create a new module versus I'm going to invent this new module to do something new. And then the last thing is features are really easy. You know, again, back to our events calendar, if someone's new to Drupal and, you know, they have a very simple need, an events calendar, they don't have to learn out of the box how to do all these different components and views and content types and fields. They can say, oh, Bob has an events calendar feature. Let me download that. I now ha have an events calendar. I can reverse engineer it and see how Bob did it, and I can learn off of that. So new users aren't starting from scratch. So let's take a look um, about why we should use features. And there's basically two main reasons we want to use them. The first reason is uh, fast and easy reuse of stuff. You know, I'm a freelance developer, so I'm making a lot of the same websites over and over again. You know, blogs, events, calendars, news feeds, all that stuff. I create features of each use case, so the next client I get, you know, I don't have to build them for this long development process and design. I can just turn on a feature, and then they can say, yeah, let's change the colors and yada, yada, yada. And so stuff gets done a lot faster. You save so much time in the long run. The second use case is uh, for advanced deployment. That's the dev stage prod stuff. Uh, what Ken was talking about in the keynote, um, one of those initiatives, getting that configuration that's in the database into the code so we can migrate it between machines and instances. Um, we'll talk tiny bits about that at the end, but we're going to mainly focus on reusing these features uh, to save ourselves time and money in the long run. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, creating a feature. So let me do this. And how's that look? 
Yeah, as good as it's going to get. So let's take a look at this. I have an uh, image gallery feature here. On the left-hand side, we have latest images. On the right-hand side, a uh, view of all the galleries. If we click on a gallery, we'll come in, we'll see all of those awesome images laid out um, using the color box module. Um, so when you click on them, it'll pop open. Man, you know, nice and pretty. That was my summer vacation last year. So uh, let's close this and we will go ahead and take a look at how this is all built uh, and put together here. And so um, once robotic me will get to it. Do -do 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 -do. All right, let's see how this is put together. I like making image galleries with two content types. The first one's a gallery. The second one is the image. Uh, images are put in galleries, uh, pretty straightforward. Here's the gallery content type. That's it, just a basic content type created, no new fields um, besides the title and the body. Here's my image gallery. I have an image field here, uh, and then I have an entity reference field. So when you create an image, you say put it in this gallery. Uh, we'll take a look at the views. My image gallery has two views. The first one is the gallery view, which just lists all the gallery, give me all gallery content types, created a menu path for it, um, nothing really fancy here. The second view are the images that appear onto the uh, gallery. So when you view an image, I'm using the entities views attach module, which is going to attach this view to an entity, in this case, the node entity of bundle gallery. And so, uh, really fun little module, uh, EVA is the machine name for it. And so this view is giving me all images, I'm attaching it to the gallery, and then my argument over here, my contextual filter is saying only grab images that have the gallery uh, ID in the URL. And so that's a simple little view. Um, These are two separate views. Uh, and then my block view uh, display on this view is showing the latest images. Uh, I'm specifying only five items, uh, you know, nothing fancy. Show me the image and show me what gallery it's in. And then next I have a context. Uh, has anyone not used the context module before? Raise your hand. The context module lets you create conditions and reactions. And so I have a condition that says, uh, when I'm on the front page, put this block in the left sidebar. And so context module is huge. Uh, it basically, for me, replaces the core block system. Because um, you can get much more advanced block placements if this is happening, if I'm on this page, if I'm viewing this node type, if I'm on this view, if you yokily dokily do this. And uh, there's a whole bunch of do this that's involved. So this context is pretty simple. If I'm on the home page, put the latest image on the left-hand side. And so now I'm going to go ahead and create the feature. And so if we, once we turn on our features module, uh, we can get to it by going to our admin and clicking uh, structure and then features. And that brings us to our features page. Here we'll see a list of uh, features that are available, if they're online, if they're not online, the state of the feature, and the actions we can do with them. Now features basically have uh, three primary states. They can be disabled, they can be enabled, or they can be overridden. If it's disabled, it's turned off. If it's enabled, it's turned on. Um, the overridden state means your feature has stuff in code, but if you go in and change the view, change a setting on the field, uh, anything that's different than what's in the code, then that feature is now overridden. There's stuff in the database that doesn't match what's in the feature. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So we're going to go in and create ourselves a new feature right here for this image gallery. Um, this is, we're basically creating a new Drupal module, so we're going to give the basic info of any other Drupal module. Uh, we got to give it a name. Eh, we'll auto-create a machine name. You can change that if you want to. Uh, we're going to give it a description of uh, the image gallery. It is the best image gallery ever. I'm going to give it a version number. And then the URL of the uh, update XML is something we are going to take a peek at 
uh, a bit later. Basically, what it does is when you download a module from Drupal.org, um, and then maybe a month goes by, and that module gets an update. When you go to your available updates, it says, hey, there's a new version. What we're saying is we're telling it to look at this URL for new versions. If we leave it blank, it'll default to uh, Drupal.org, I think. So anyway, let's take a look. Um, I clicked on the components menu here, and this is where we're going to start to actually export our stuff. And we can see I have the strong arm module turned on, so I see strong arm there. And that's the only, for this demo, uh, custom module not custom, contrib module that I'm using here, but all that other stuff here is what we saw in one of those first slides that we can export, content types, context, dependencies, all that fun stuff. So we're going to start at the top with content types, and I'm going to say let's download our gallery module, and then hocus pocus, abracadabra, boosh, what just happened there? So what we did is we said I want to export the gallery content type into this feature, and what feature said is, oh, that's really fine, um, but if you're going to export that module, then you also probably want to export this field, and you probably also want to export all of these uh, strong arm variables that are related to the gallery content type. And if you're downloading a content type, then you're probably going to have to uh, depend on the node module and the strong arm module since we're doing all these variables, and the text module since we're getting this field. And so Features is automatically detecting what it thinks you also want to download which is useful. So we'll hit next, and uh, the next thing we're going to do is grab our uh, image gallery. So we'll click on image content type, and it's going to grab all the other fields and all the other strong arm variables. Next, we'll select our context, what we use to set the block on the home page, conditions and reactions. After a short coffee break, we will select our dependencies. No, we'll go to views, I guess. We're going to select our gallery view and our gallery image views. I could have made this one view, but for the demo, I just picked two. So the next thing we're going to do is download dependencies. Now, you see I'm using the color box module with my views as a display formatter, but features is not that smart. It knows that I need the view, but it doesn't know that it's using color box. So I want to add a dependency to color box so my view doesn't break on the new sites. Uh, something else we see is that my entity views attach module isn't being included either. So I'm going to go ahead and add a dependency to that as well. So image styles, we don't have any. Uh, I'm not. I'm using the core image presets, but that's where I'd select them. And our strong arm variables uh, is where I like to get click happy. Um, here we have all the variables in a Drupal site, which is a lot. I mean, it's ridiculous how many there are. So what I like to do to make sure I don't miss anything is grab everything related to these. Uh, content types. Um, there's a few different ways to create features, you know, methods, theories on what should go in a feature. Some people like to create a feature, you know, image gallery content types, image gallery views, image gallery permissions, break it up across 10 features for the one image gallery. Uh, some people like to create features, my site, and pack everything into it. I like to create features that are concentrated use cases, but everything related to that feature goes into it. Um, content types, permissions, views, all of it goes into that feature and nothing else. You know, I'm not going to put event gallery stuff into my image gallery feature. If there's something that, you know, maybe kind of goes with both, maybe I have a home page rotator uh, that pulls content from news, events, and uh, galleries, I wouldn't put any of that stuff in any of those three features. I'd create its own feature that would depend on those three features. Um, nobody's really done benchmarks benchmarks to see if having a million features uh, is any worse than having, you know, one humongous feature. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to, go ahead. So uh, what I like to do in Strongarm, since there's so many uh, variables, is I'll use my browser uh, find and hit control find and type in gallery, my machine name, and then I'll basically go through and click off everything that's related to the gallery content type. Now, I'm pretty experienced with features. I've been using them for a very long time, so 
I know that I can blindly go in and click things after looking at them really fast. If you knew the features, look at each variable and make sure you actually want it in your feature. Um, there's certain variables you don't want to export to your feature. Um, things, variables that may affect multiple different things in Drupal. Again, if there's one variable that affects your events, your images, and your news, don't put that in your feature. Um, if there's a variable that lives in a we, we state of existence, not existence, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, you don't want to mess with dynamic variables like that. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this because it's getting ahead of me. Um, so don't put features like that or variables like that in your features because it will break stuff in the long run. So I selected my variables. And then the last step I'm going to have here, and you will see in the gray items, the blue ones are what's been auto-detected. The gray items are what's been you know, uh, selected by me. I hit the download button, and here's my feature downloaded uh, to my desktop. I'm now going to drag it over into a brand new site um, that's using the same modules as the original. And so here's this new site. And I'm going to go ahead and turn that features on, feature on. Now, an, a thing that I drill into people is features are modules. Modules are, are not features, but features are <laughs> modules. So all of your features will appear on the module page. Uh, you can enable them on the module page. You can enable them on the uh, features page. It doesn't matter. I tend to do it on the module page because I like to see what the dependencies are, um, You know, if there's any config custom stuff going on. So I'm going to select it on this module page and hit Save Configuration. Now, this was a blank site with nothing on it, just modules turned on, a different theme. And now that this feature is turned on, let's go ahead and clear the cache. Now that this feature is turned on, all of those views, all of those content types, that context, uh, those fields, they've all been now created and applied to this website. So I don't have to start from scratch with this new site. I have an image gallery out of a box. And so now if I look at the uh, home page here, we'll see my gallery menu link that wasn't there before. But it's empty. So let's go ahead and generate some content, and we'll make sure that our feature is actually still working. And so I uh, like to use the Devel module and the Devel generate module um, when I'm developing. Uh, you know, before I get content from clients, I'm just going to generate blank dummy content um, to make sure stuff is looking the way it's supposed to. So I will generate myself uh, five galleries. And then I'll create myself a bunch of images to go in the gallery. And now if I go to the galleries page, uh, after this stuff is generated, we'll now have a nice full view of galleries. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Latest images, galleries, all there, all that work done. But looking at this, we see it looks much different. Not much different, but a bit different than what we started out with. All these images are on the front-facing view, um, but they weren't over here on this view. So what's up with that? Well, the problem is there's a variable where that data is stored uh, called field bundle settings. Uh, and the problem with that variable is it holds the display settings for all of your content type. So that's one of those variables that affects a lot of stuff that we don't want to put in our feature. So we'll just come over here and hide it for teaser views, and then we'll be back to normal. Um, it's really annoying. Uh, it, all that stuff should obviously be in its own variable. Uh, and now that we have it fixed here, we're good to go. So stuff like that. Um, we remember that this is just a Drupal module. So anything that you can do in a regular module, you can do in your uh, features module. 
So if you need to do stuff that couldn't be exported, write an install hook to do all that stuff uh, you know, upon completion. So split field bundle setting um, is obviously an issue. Uh, it's up on Drupal.org. Uh, they, I think at this point it's been fixed, it's been tested, uh, and it's been rolled out for a the, the latest version of Drupal 7, so I don't even think this is an issue anymore. Um, but it's just a great example of uh, why you should pay attention to the variables and how it can affect uh, what you're doing. So that is how to create a feature. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to put on our imagination caps and uh, think about how we can use this uh, in our lives. This works for everybody, whether you're an individual freelancer like myself or a big you know, company like Media Current uh, that has huge clients. You know, we're going to create features, reusable stuff, spend our time on it, put it into it, and then we're done. You know, the next time a client says, hey, I need a big image gallery, I don't have to spend the however many hours to build out all this stuff. I can turn it on and have it ready for them, and then they can either spend time on making it a little better, making it unique, or poof, it's just dumb, uh, done. And they say, hey, wow, you know, that was great and fast, and we love you. Here's more money. So next, features are modules. Anything you can do in a module, you can do in your feature. And so we're going to see a little demo here on how we can add custom code to our feature. Um, so let's take a look at this. So here's my image gallery on my purple site now. And uh, I think what I want to do is two things. Uh, the first thing I want to do is all those images right there, that's really ugly. I need to apply some CSS to that to make it look pretty. When I make features, I like to have them look good out of the box. You know, a lot of modules that have UI elements to them, they come with some basic CSS to make it look good, and then you can, you know, override that CSS uh, as you want. I do the same thing with my features. I add generic CSS where maybe I don't need to change it. Uh, and if my themer wants to, he can. The other thing I want to add is how cool would it be is if I'm looking at the image gallery and there's a link that says add image and they click the link and it opens in a modal with the image node form and they can add the image and hit save and it just Ajaxes the uh, image gallery and poof, it's all there, Ajax and magic. So that's what we're going to do. I think that'd be awesome. So let's take a look at our feature module um, as it is before we mess with it. Um, like any module, we see we have our dot module file, and then we have a bunch of include files. And do you want to move over so I'm not, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we have our dot module file, our dot info file, like uh, every Drupal module does. And then we have these five other modules, which are the includes. So if we look at our uh, info file, pretty straightforward, the stuff at the top, but then everything below are all the exportables, and features reads this to see what is in the feature. And so if we look at our .module file, that's it. It's just saying, hey, include all this feature stuff over here. Um, and then if we look at our includes, now this is where features magic is happening. Now all features is really doing in some cases is uh, implementing Drupal hooks. You know, here it's implementing hook node info to create those content types. Um, so it's not cr crazy voodoo magic, just a little bit of magic. So when you're editing these modules, um, we want to remember that the include stuff is code that's generated from uh, from features, and that anything with the dot include, you probably don't want to mess with unless you're a features guru and know what you're doing. Um, the dot module file, the dot info file, yeah, add stuff to that all you want. So that's what we're going to do. I copied over a CSS file an info file, an install file, we're going to ignore, and a module file, a new module file. And we will see what changes I've made. So if we look at our, uh, open these up, we will start with our info file. Um, all I have done here is down at the bottom, added CSS. Uh, in Drupal 6, I would have done a hook init uh, to include Drupal add CSS. There's my awesome CSS file. Obviously, I'm a developer. So uh, here is my uh, .module file. Now, we at the top, we still have our include imagegallery.features.inc. You don't, again, you don't want to mess with that, or else your features is going to break. But everything below, the sky is the limit. You can do whatever you want. 
And so I have added a few hooks here. I created a menu path for my C tools. I created a, uh, a hook node view to add the link, and then my menu path callback and a form alter. And so, you know, I think there was like 50 lines of code here. Um, don't mess with the dot include, seriously. And so let's go ahead and see what this looks like. I've added the code, let's clear the cache, and uh, we'll see some magic. The first thing we're gonna notice is our CSS being applied. Um, I'm just floating that stuff. Again, I, I pay a designer to do all that kind of stuff. So pretty straightforward. Um, and now we have a new link at the bottom, add new image. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. But first I'm gonna change users, so I'm not user one. And so I click on it, and now I'm in the C tools modal. Let's go ahead. There's me at Disney World. That was actually my vacation last summer. The gallery is already pre selected, so I'm going to hit save. And now, poof, I'm Ajaxing that image right there into the view, and there it is. And so it's a great example about how you can take a basic feature. Again, semantics are getting me a, a use case, our galleries that we've exported with features and add your own custom code to it to make it even better. So now when you're shipping this image gallery or reusing it, you're including all your custom stuff uh, that's gonna make it special because we all wanna be special. So uh, that's adding custom code to features. Features are modules, anything you do with a module, you could do with a feature and I highly encourage it. Um, so organizing and share. So we have these features. Uh, what do we want to do with them? They were originally created to kind of have this decentralized approach where, uh, you know, I'm fantastic with my image galleries and my blogs. Bob is fantastic with his uh, real estate feature. Tommy knows how to do the news and the, you know, events calendar features. We all have these features and we're sharing them with each other like we would upload them to Drupal.org. Um, there's a few different ways we can share these features. Uh, the first one is feature servers, which are kind of antiquated and nobody really uses them anymore. We'll still kind of take a look at a quick demo real quick to see if you like it, you can use it. Feature server is basically a dumbed down version of the project module. It lets you create projects and releases and make it available for other people to link into and download. Um, you know, this is a module. You can upload it to uh, github.com if you want and make it available there. Tell people you're developing this awesome feature, yada, yada, yada. Um, but really now, drupal.org. Uh, originally, features were kind of, you know, I don't want to say shunned, but didn't, they weren't accepted much on drupal.org because they weren't real modules. They were just feature modules and we didn't want to pollute the module sphere with these you know, we didn't want a thousand blog features on Drupal.org as projects. Um, but now since the great Git migration, anybody and their cousin crea can create a Git sandbox. You know, I think I have like 13 sandboxes. So create a feature and if you think it's remotely useful for someone else, slap it in a sandbox. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I created a very small module uh, that linked views and web form selects uh, together. So your select component on views could, uh, be fed from a, your select component on web form could be fed from a view. You know, I think it was 30 lines of code, 50 lines of code, slapped it up in the sandbox. I don't even work on the project I originally made it for anymore. Uh, within a month, I had like 13 people patching it and working on it. I was like, oh, okay. So put your stuff up on Drupal.org sandboxes. Uh, you know, people will definitely help on it if it's useful. Uh, and maybe one day it'll be a real module. So um, we're going to look at feature servers just a little bit. Um, again, nobody really uses them a whole lot now, but it's a pretty great example for what we're doing next. So here's my feature server I've installed locally. Um, I got no projects or distributions, so I'm gonna create content. Uh, we see feature server creates a distribution, a project, and a release for us. I'm gonna create a new project call up my image gallery, fill out all that same information about the feature. Um, one weird paradox thing about a feature server is the feature server is actually a feature. <laughs> so it's another example of, it's a feature server that, you know, basically it, it's features are great as a Kickstarter for developers. You know, you don't want to hand code that entity stuff or that node stuff, so you just 
start it with a feature and then add your custom code to that. There's nothing wrong with it. And so that's what feature service does. It's a feature and then a bunch of custom code that does all this. And so I created my image gallery project, uh, some information. If, <coughs> if I wanted to add uh, you know, the project status URL to say, come look at my feature server for updates. Um, and that's one nice draw about the feature server is as you release new updates to your feature server, if other people are using your features or even in your own sites, you'll be notified saying, hey, your feature server has a new version. You should go get it. So I'm going to create a new release here. I selected my tar file. I'm going to select my project, select the version, the patch number. Um, you know, if I wanted to type alpha, dev, you know, whatever, you could add that there. Um, extra version stuff is what it was above. We'll skip that. Here you can select if this is a recommended or security release. That ties into, again, the update um, status. If it's just a recommended, your update status will say, hey, there's a new version over here. If it's security release, it'll say, hey, there's a new version over there. Go get it. And so here it is. Uh, we now have a download link available. Um, and if we go back to the project, uh, that we added this to, we'll now see it looks very similar to uh, the Drupal.org projects page where we have releases, you know, the package, uh, the version, yada, yada, yada. And we can look at my release notes and there it is. And so it's pretty straightforward, uh, you know, if this is how your company wants to organize your features, that's fine. Um, I put all of my features in a, uh, my own Git server. So that's just how I do it. And that is a feature server. So Drush. Um, who has never used Drush before? Are you on Windows? Whew, thank God. It's a Linux fest, you know. So Drush. We love Drush. So let's go ahead and take a look at Drush. Uh, Drush can do a bunch of stuff for us. rude sometimes. Uh, oh, I know. There we go. All right. So Drush. Drush is fantastic. Um, for those of you ha that don't use it that much or don't know what it is, it's a command line tool for Drupal um, that lets you do a bunch of stuff from the command line. And so here is just a quick little sampling about what Drush can do. Uh, We'll scroll up here, a bunch of core stuff, creating archives, core status, search stuff, uh, site installs, aliases, variable stuff, um, the watchdog stuff. But the, the, the best part of Drush, and this is where I use it, and I think a lot of people 99% of the time use, is the project manager commands. When you need a new module without Drush, what do you do? You gotta go to drupal.org, download the tarball, unzip it, uh, FTP it all up, or SSH it all up because nobody uses FTP because it's insecure. With Drush, Drush download this module. It's done. You want five modules? Drush download, views, C tools, yada, 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 enter. It's done. Um, so Drush is fantastic. Uh, Shrop is gonna talk about it uh, in the next session. So I highly encourage you to go see that as part of his distributions. Um, so Drush is pretty fantastic. I'm not gonna go into it. There's plenty of tutorials and stuff online. Uh, on the Drupal Dojo, uh, I did a webcast on how to install Drush on pretty much any Unix machine. Um, shared server, VPS. So uh, definitely check that out. And so my favorite part of Drush though is Drush Make. And what Drush Make does is it basically lets you create a make file um, or a, 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 a recipe for your entire site uh, in a single text file that you can execute with Drush and Drush will go out and get all that stuff for you and uh, create yourself a Drupal site. So let's go ahead and take a look at Drush Make in action. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna recreate our site that we've been working. Now there's nothing in this directory, nothing up my sleeves because I'm not wearing anything. So I'm gonna run drush make me dot make. Um, and what I think I should probably do is show you what a make file looks like first. So 
but this is what I'd like to ask you about. It's pretty simple. I'm saying we're working with Drupal 7. The API version is 2 for Drush Make. Um, go get me Drupal. Go get me these modules. Uh, go get me the Colorbox library from colorpower.com, Colorbox, ColorZip, and put it in the Colorbox directory in the libraries directory. Uh, and then I'm saying, go get me my image gallery feature from my feature server at featureserverlocal.fserver. Um, Drush, that's just scratching the surface of Drush Make. And uh, I can show you more later if you're into this kind of thing, or Mark will show you. Uh, Drush can get you specific versions of modules. It can put them in specific places for you. Drush will check out modules from any type of, well, not any type, Git, Subversion, Bazaar, uh, CSV. It'll check it out from version control for you. It will go get a patch and apply it to the module for you. So if you like to live on the edge, you can do that. Um, and so it, c it can do pretty much anything. It can make you a sandwich. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look. So what I'm going to do is, in this empty directory, nothing there, I'm going to say drush make my make file, and then I'm going to add a command that says prepare install. What that does is it uh, copies the settings.php file over and gets all that. It basically prepares it for install, like it says. So I'm going to run this. Do you want to make a new site here? Well, of course I do. And so what it's going to do here is it's reading the make file to make sure it understands you want the date module. The date module's over there. I got it. If it can't find anything, uh, a module, it's going to error out and say, well, I had some issues. So after it's done inspecting everything, it's now downloading stuff. So we saw Drupal downloaded from Drupal.org, FTP.Drupal.org, Image Gallery downloaded from FeatureServer.Local, all these modules downloaded from uh, all these different sites. And when it was done, we now have a Drupal site all downloaded, ready to go. And so let's take a look at what we got here. If I refresh my page, Ah, here I am on install, so let's go ahead and quickly install this. And while that's installing, we'll put on an imagination cap. So what we're trying to do here is save time, save money, uh, make things easier on us. Because I don't know about you, I'm really, really lazy. And so with Drush Make, I can go from having nothing to having my personal platform with my personal features all ready to go uh, within minutes. So I'm installing the site here. Just make my username, my top secret password. It's password. Turn off that update stuff, save it, visit my new site, fantastic. So the first thing I'm going to do when I visit my new site is, well, I don't know, let's see what I do. I'm going to head to the modules page because I want to turn on my image gallery feature and all the other features that I created. So let's go over the modules and we'll scroll down. We'll see all the modules that have been downloaded. Yes, this was recorded at DrupalCon. <laughs> so here's my image gallery. I'm going to hit save to that. Do you want to turn on all this other stuff? Yes, I want to turn on all this other stuff. And now I go to features or my, uh, there's my gallery menu and then we can use our imagination, create content types. So it's really fantastic. We've gone from nothing to a whole site in a matter of minutes. And so that's one of the great, great, great features of features. Um, you know, reusing this stuff over and over again. Uh, so you're saving time. And if you're a freelancer and you still want to build that time to your client, that's up to you. So uh, that's pretty much a synopsis of using features to reuse stuff over and over again. It's a fantastic tool. I highly encourage you to use it. Here's another use case for features, which is uh, less used by the smaller companies, but sometimes required by the bigger companies. Um, you know, deployment, local, dev, stage, prod. When you have huge, huge companies, uh, big, humongous website contracts, uh, websites can't go down which means you can't just be editing on production for these humongous contracts. So the, what we do is we break up the uh, development process into multiple stages. I'm going to work on a feature uh, component on the website here, 
and then I'm going to push all those changes up to the dev server, and then the rest of the development team pushes their stuff up on the dev server, and then we all work together and make sure all of our stuff works together, and once that looks good, we're going to push all of that stuff to the staging server, and then the client comes in and says, oh yeah, that looks great, we love it, and then we push it to the production server. In a strict environment, nothing happens on prod, stage, and dev except test. All work that gets done happens on local. So how does features fit into this? Well, it goes something like this. I download, uh, I upload my image gallery feature, um, and it gets all the way to staging, and the client says, well, we don't like that grid on the view. Um, can we make it a list? And we say, sure. So I'm going to go back to my local development, and I'm going to change uh, the view, and now my view is in an overridden state because my view does not match which is in the, what's in the code. So I'm going to go to Drush now, and I'm going to say Drush FU, Drush Feature Update, my feature. And what that's going to do is take the overrides and write them to the code. And now that, that those overrides are in the code, now that the feature's in the code, I can use Git to commit it and push it on up, and now they have their list instead of their grid. And so the workflow is pretty simple. We're going to create our features locally, commit them to Git, then we're going to come to our dev server and pull them up or pull to the staging. Uh, they say, the, let's change this, let's change that, yada, yada, yada. We come back to our local, we make the changes, we do drush fu, everything's written in code, we're back at step two, commit it, push it up. And so it's this big circle of we're pushing our code up the system and pulling database changes down. Um, so if you want to know more about that, we can chat later on. Um, I don't know if Mark is going to be talking about that, but Zach, uh, after lunch, will be talking about um, Agar and continuous integration, and this is a, a decent part of that. So I highly encourage you. And uh, I love how they set up the sessions. It works out fantastic. Learn about features here. Go to Mark's Next and learn about the next steps of distributions and such, and then learn how to pull it all together with Zach. So safely overriding features. I don't know when this is supposed to end. What time? Hmm? 14 minutes, fantastic. All right, so safely overriding features. Um, does anyone use like Open Atrium, Open Public, stuff like that? So all these big companies are creating these big distributions and they're all based in features and they're fantastic and they're beautiful, um, but you don't just download it and then say, whew, this website's done, I can go home. You know, you're gonna make changes to the views, you're gonna tweak some things, you're gonna change things over here. Um, that puts your features in an overridden state. And you really don't want your features to be overridden because it means stuff is unstable. Uh, so if I download version one of um, you know, open public uh, and then I make changes, when they come out with version two, if I try and download that, it's gonna overwrite all of my changes that I've made in the database. And so we don't wanna do that. So what we wanna do is save our overrides off to the side so we can still maintain the core feature without deleting our overrides. And the way we do that is with the features override module. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that, it's features underscore override on Drupal.org. Um, and what that lets you do is, and it sort of works in Drupal 6, and I think it's finally working good in Drupal 7. Uh, there was a great release the week before DrupalCon. Um, you make your overrides, uh, from your distribution, and then what you'll do is you'll create a new feature and export those overrides to code. And now you have your overrides in a feature and your core feature in a feature, and you can update the core feature without affecting your overrides. And it's fantastic. And if you wanna, if you're interested in the underlying part of it, you know, think about features as implementing hook node info to create that uh, node info stuff where features override is implementing the alter hooks. And so your feature gets implemented, then the alter hooks alter it. And so it's pretty neat. Um, I'm fairly sure it's working decently stable right now, uh, and it's a fantastic tool. So um, what have I forgotten? Another great features tool is uh, Features Tools module. It's F-Tools uh, is the machine name. And that module does two things. Um, one of them is I use well. Uh, you back to the development process, we're making changes and overriding our features and we want to write them the code. Um, if you got people, if you're not comfortable in the command line or something like that, 
Uh, instead of having to recreate that feature with the new stuff and then re-upload it, if you set the permissions on those features to be writable by the server, then Features Tools adds a new button that says Auto Create Feature to the uh, Recreate Features button uh, page. So when you click Auto Create Features, it basically runs Drush FU, but its own version of it, and recreates the feature in place in code. Um, the same way Drush FU does, but it's not on the command line. So uh, that's a cool tool that I use sometimes. And uh, another one is if you want to take something out of a feature, maybe you uh, create a feature over here, but you only want some of that on this site, so you can create the feature and bring it over here, and Feature Tools has an unlink uh, uh, feature, and I don't haven't really used it that much from what I understand is you'll do the recreate, and when you unselect things, you're going to click the Safe Recreate button. And what it will do is it will remove that stuff from the feature, but it will create an export file that you can then grab and put through the UI, which will recreate those exported stuff. So it's out of the feature, but back in the database. Um, I haven't used it that much. I don't know if it works, but I know it's out there. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, we created our features. We cr added custom code to it. We created a make file. Uh, so we have our own little mini distribution. Um, and then I ran the make file. And that was pretty much where we ended. Uh, there's a lot more you can do. Um, you know, I had to manually go turn those features on. I had to manually go select a theme. Well, the next step is to create yourself a installation profile that does all that for you. Uh, your install profile is going to say, you know, turn all of these features on. Maybe you create a UI where you select the features when you're installing it. You know, a lot, a very similar to uh, how some of the install profiles distributions work out there today. Um, you know, there's the apps module and app servers. Uh, you know, if anybody doesn't know what an app is or thinks it's crazy, raise your hand. You guys are awesome. So apps basically add a stupid user interface to features. Um, features are great and easy for users, uh, but they're easy for users like us. You know, you add a marketing person off the street that's used to WordPress prettiness uh, to turn on, you know, you say, well, you got to install Drupal, then you got to turn on, you know, go to the modules page or go to the features page or turn this on, this on, this on. What apps does, it creates eye candy on top of this interface. And so your apps, uh, are basically, again, like any other module or feature, but what it has that the others don't is an app manifest, and the app manifest defines basically the dependencies of that app. And so it hooks into the core Drupal 7 update uh, API. So when you say, turn on my image gallery app, uh, if I don't have views on the site, it will tie into that API and download views for you. Um, and so it, it's a nice, pretty interface, and uh, there's a lot of strides going there f for reviews and you know comments and stuff like that. And uh, I think it's pretty much the direction that distributions are heading. Mark will probably know, talk a lot more about that than I will. Um, and app servers. Sure. So that's it. Um, any questions? Mm-hmm. So, so the question is, how does features handle conflicts, naming conflicts, for example? Uh, I manually created a content type on this site called image underscore gallery, and now I just put this module on the site that's called image underscore gallery. If I go to the features page, it won't let me turn that module on. Um, it'll say there's a conflict. Uh, if you export the same thing in the two features, you know, one from this site and one from that site, it'll say, hey, this is conflicting with that feature. Uh, you know, we can't turn this on for you. Um, if it happens by accident uh, somehow, which it can happen, uh, stuff gets committed to code uh, while two features are already turned on, and it's, you know, it will say it's conflicted, but it's turned on. Uh, hankiness will happen. Um, to be honest, um, I, I don't horribly know uh, what the overall effects would be. Uh, I'm it's decently smart enough. Uh, I don't think if you go to the modules page, it'll be disabled. Uh, you know, you'll turn it on and your site will explode. So that'll be a good key. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and so, so the, there is a the unique name thing. Um, there is a standard out there called the Kit standard. Um, I don't know if it's actually widely being used. I read it and said, "Wow, that's great advice." Then moved on. Um, but it basically addresses subjects on how on um, you know we want to be able to reuse this stuff. When I create a feature on app, my app should be able to work in media currents distributions as well as phase two distributions. Um, you know, we want it to be able to move around. And so part of that is namespacing. You know, maybe I call uh, my image gallery MC underscore image gallery uh, Matthew Connerton, you know, and all um, anything, you know, no types maybe, context, uh, views. Uh, I don't think fields would be much of an issue. Um, you know, I, I haven't spent a lot of time testing conflicts. I think I should do that next. they would go in and immediately override every single site in this shared code base. And so what we tried to do then was to disconnect features and leave everything like it was. And so I, I wondered if there was any plans for it to be actually part of the module to say, okay, I've deployed it and now I want to disconnect. Because we had to go into the database and you know, still make it work that way. So I, d I didn't know if there were more people that wanted that kind of functionality. It's pretty much like a almost like feeds, but like an export yeah. and deploy, but it doesn't depend on this module uh, being enabled on. A lot of that depends on the component itself. Um, if you have a feature that, that creates a content type, and then you turn off the feature, that content type is still there. It's not deleted. Um, if you have... Yes. Um, and then, but there's others. So the, the depending on how the content is stored, you know, some content is happy to live in the database, uh, and that's where it's pulled from. Some content uh, is happy, components are happy to live in the code, and it can be pulled directly from the, the code. CTools does a lot of uh, integration of stuff like that. Um, you know, to answer your question, I don't know if what kind of tools are going to be added to features. Uh, I'd say look at the issue queue. The, that whole pulling stuff out of features is definitely uh, a complaint. Uh, features tools, that module tied to address that with the unlinking functionality, but I don't know if it's going in the core. It should. I'd check the issue queue, and if it doesn't there, say, hey, let's add this functionality and see what happens. How would you copy a feature and just take pieces of that feature and then recreate your own? For example, the COD distribution, if I like the presenter, piece of the feature, but it's depend dependent on the COD base feature. Mm -hmm. How could I, you know, take pieces from different features and create my own? Gotcha. Um, well, the way I would do it is I'd go right into the code, copy the feature over, and just start deleting it. I don't need that. You know, I don't need any of these permissions. I don't need this. And just delete it out of there. Because I have used features enough and have been in the features generated code, um, it's not difficult to learn. Uh, you know, you just don't want to break, th if you follow their predefined structure, you can mess with it all you want. Um, and so that's what I do. I often, when I'm doing cleanup of sites, you know, uh, that's what I do as a freelancer sometimes is come in to big sites and clean them up. You know, I have to combine features, split features apart, uh, and I just do it right at the code level. So um, that's one way to do it. It's for doing it in the UI. Uh, if I create a feature and say this content type is in this feature, and then I go to create another feature, that content type is not in the list anymore. And so, you know, we're back to, you want to get this stuff back into the database so you can export it into a new feature. Uh, so I'd say check out that features tools on link uh, feature of that. And see how many times have I said features in this presentation? Semantics, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I would check that out. Uh, and that those are your two options. Try and unlink it to the database and then create your new feature from it or just do it in the code. Did you have a question? Anybody questions? <laughs> okay, fantastic. If you do have questions and you're just shy, please come up and ask me. Uh, I'll be here all day and the after party. Uh, please go to Mark's if you're interested in this workflow. 
Mark's session is next about creating your own distributions, and it will be fantastic. Then after lunch, uh, Zach is doing Agar and continuous integration with Jenkins, I think, and all that good stuff. So that is the next logical step after Mark. So thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk 
has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.